Welcome everybody to uh, this amazing webinar. I'm so excited that you're here. My name is Carrie Arnold. I'm the new program director at Fielding Graduate University and I oversee the evidence-based coaching program. And my predecessor, Dr. Terry Hildebrandt is also here and we may co-host at times. I'm very excited to introduce Four Arrows. He also goes by Don Jacobs, but we like to call him Four Arrows. And before I get into like the bio and all the great things you've done, <clears throat> I want to say just a few things about my interaction with Four Arrows. So I got my PhD at Fielding and I finished in 2016 and I never had the opportunity to study directly under him. However, when I would go to summer and winter session, I would always find a way of getting into his presentations and I just was always fascinated by him. And I don't know if you remember this Four Arrows, but after I finished my PhD and I went into my postdoc research, out of the blue, you sent me an article. And I hadn't heard from you in a while. It's just it this amazing article and I opened it up and I read it and it was on metaphor and it was on women. It was on um, the role of Native American women when America was being colonized. And it just had such a profound impact on me that I, I hung on to it. And in the book I recently published, I talk about you and you're in my references. It's just, you never know how someone you're gonna interact with is gonna make a difference later. And, and you are one of those people for sure, I feel like. Oh, I'm, I'm very honored, but that, you know, that is the nature of teaching, isn't it? You, it you is. can go all your life and you're an old, old man like I am and then some young person comes in and says, you know, in the third grade, you talk about that. <laughs> Well, true, I was a little older than that, but true. Um, you know, there's so much to your bio and there's so much to your background and I can't do you justice and I will certainly invite Terry to jump in and say some great things about you. You've, you're a prolific writer, you're a prolific speaker, you have this amazing way of being provocative in a way that helps people learn. Um, Four Arrows is faculty at Fielding Graduate University. He's a previous dean. He lives in Mexico. You used to be a sports psychologist. You're a pianist, if I remember correctly. You've got all kinds of stuff going on. Well, you know what? Let's just get on with it. Let's, Let's just get, get on, on with it. Well, before you start, Terry, I want to invite you to say a few words about Four Arrows. I know you guys have such a great relationship. Absolutely. So, uh, Four Arrows, um, I uh, got to know as a colleague, um, primarily uh, as, a, uh, a, as part of the doctoral faculty um, working on evidence-based coaching. And um, we've had many, many conversations via email and in person about uh, the topic that he's discovering and, and talking about and, and really um, uh, promoting uh, today in our webinar. So I was excited to uh, have uh, invite Four Arrows to be part of this evidence-based coaching uh, thought leaders webinar series and he grac graciously uh, was willing to do that um, and also if you haven't uh, read his blog um, we have a blog post which I'll post in the chat room uh, that he uh, did for us along with a handout uh, that I'm sure we'll be talking about today so uh, Four Arrows is, is an amazing guy and, and is really uh, has done work in so many areas and, and is committed to bring in an, an indigenous worldview to us today. And, and I think the timing couldn't be better uh, as we're talking more and more about diversity and, and new perspectives and really uh, finding solutions to some of the world's really tough problems. And I think Ferro Arrows has some, uh, some things to say to us today that uh, really will further our thinking and challenge us in many ways as coaches. So thank you for being here. I'm honored uh, to have you be part of the Evans Space Coaching Program and the larger Fielding Graduate University. Well, thanks to both you and, and Carrie for your very gracious words. And I'm really honored to, to be doing this uh, for my own exploration and learning because um, although I've been a coach of probably many different varieties, uh, this is the first time that I've really had an opportunity to try to articulate the connection which you were responsible for, uh, Terry, uh, between this, this concept of coaching that's taken off all over the world and the indigenous worldview and worldview reflection, which is just beginning to, uh, to, to really strike, strike chords. So um, I would like to 
to start because we are in a time of very great challenges. And everyone on this call, I'm sure, in some way is suffering through the current pandemic. Um, one of the things about indigenous worldview that I hope will be, if nothing else, uh, important for the idea of coaching is what the Navajo is saying. You know, we've got lots of Navajo students here and their beauty uh, way, uh, this is also called the pollen path. No matter how difficult things are, and they certainly have been for the Navajo, the songs that they sing in this beauty way uh, prayer is uh, see the beauty before you, behind you, to the right, to the left, above and below. And in my own Shalagi tradition, on the Trail of Tears, or another tragic thing like the Navajo Long Walk, uh, where somebody like Trump, who was Andrew Jackson, forced the American Indian people who were neighbors uh, in the southern states uh, at gunpoint out of their homes and lands against the Supreme Court ruling and forced them into Oklahoma territory. And most of you know the tragedy. But the mothers every night would sing a lullaby to their children. And the words were to go something like, did you see the beautiful clouds and the animals in them? Did you see that beautiful trout in the brook with the colors radiating as we crossed it? Did you see the dancing grasses in the prairie? Did you hear the beautiful songs of the birds, etc.? So I just would like uh, to say a few words in my language, uh, my Lakota language, that remind us that we're all related uh, to the four leggeds to the swimmers, to the crawlers, to the all living in sentience and everything is sentient. But to remember, no matter how difficult things are, that water is still there to take care of us and coach us, that the winds are still there to take care of us and coach us into health and our optimal beings, and that the trees and rivers and animals are. So as you listen to this lullaby, think of a mother singing this in the worst of times. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody and uh, we'll run through this PowerPoint really quickly so you kind of know where I'm coming from so that uh, you can think of some questions and, and challenging uh, things for me to think about. So I actually put this together uh, yesterday just for you guys. What is coaching and what is worldview? Um, I looked up all the different kinds of coaching and I saw professionals in sport, life, business, executive, leadership, health, life, coaching, uh, helping someone understand their present experience, exploring mindsets to help somebody see options differently, helping someone understand personal value and belief systems and how these show up on quote uh, from some certified coach uh, uh, with a corporation called New Exec, all seem to apply to every kind of coaching there is. And I was struck by both the, the diversity of the fields that people have brought coaching into, but also by how what they say coaching is allows me to share a hypothesis with you that the ultimate set of such beliefs about fundamental aspects of reality that ground and influence all of them is what we can define as a, a worldview. Um, so with that in mind, I hope that, this, that there's a relevance uh, that you see right away. Now, I have an unusual take, but it's one that one of the, uh, uh, the, the founders of field, Fielding had a, a guru in Robert Fielding, uh, I mean, uh, Robert Redfield from the University of Chicago, um, who had a, he was 
considered the father of social anthropology. And he, he said, you know, there's really only two worldviews. There were three, he thought, the Eastern one, the Western one, and the, what he called the indigenous one. But he said that, that by the time he died in the late 50s, really all, the only two essential worldviews that exist are the, what he called the metropolitan one, and that's the dominant one that's been guiding us for about 9,000 years, and what he called the primitive one, which was the one that guided us for 99% of human history. So I like to go by that philosophy, and if you look at a lot of the discussions, although for most of the last 30 years since the idea of worldview came out of Germany, everything is a worldview, a religion, a culture, a belief. The research now almost always boils down to that all the great diversity of religions and diversity of cultures and beliefs have common denominators that bind them under a dominant worldview, such as a, a human-centered or a human-dominant concept of anthropocentrism. Similarly, all the great diversity of indigenous cultures and nations with their great diversity of beliefs and spiritual traditions, they have those things in common, but one of which then would be that they, they, they do not have an anthropocentric worldview. So that's going to be a hypothesis that I'll be sharing with you. Now, I just finished a book just this morning, sent it off to the publisher about quotes from Sitting Bull, in which each chapter is about a quote that reflects an indigenous worldview and uh, how our goal is to move in, in this theory that I'm going to present you today from an institutionalized culture that essentially is based in the left column here. And I'll show you a worldview chart that has 40 of these. These are just the 17 chapters where you can be on either side, of course, here and there. But generally speaking, in a dominant worldview, we expect and accept and oftentimes practice ways of being in education, religions, in our cultural ways that are on the left side. So you can just see those and you can get a sense of how a, and I am going to make the, the argument that our indigenous worldview, which research shows, for example, in the first one, moving from an untruthfulness priority to a truthfulness, uh, in, in, in a scholar, scholars in a book called a Time Before Deception showed that we did ceremonies, the Lakota did ceremonies when the Europeans first broke treaties and lied about them because we thought they had a mental illness because the concept of, of intentional lying was just so far. So anyway, that's just some of the movements that I believe we, we all want to, will, as coaches, want to consider as problematics holding people back if you're into dualistic thinking, if you're detached, if you're materialistic, if you have a low social purpose, you know, relatively low personal vitality, all, you know, all these things that I'll show you when we look at the larger chart. I want to suggest right now at the very beginning that if you use the chart, and I'm going to make it available to everybody, you can use that chart to help your clients see how worldview might be getting in the way of optimal uh, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, right? And so, uh, you know, this is, this is something that, uh, this idea that indigenous worldview has this value. Uh, I, 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 I came upon Dr. Edgar, Edgar Mitchell uh, before he passed on. Uh, he was the seventh man on the moon, uh, to walk on the moon if, with, you know, and he looked down at the planet Earth when he was up there and he had an epiphany came back, he quit NASA, founded the, the very respected Institute of Noetic Sciences, uh, recognizing how we're all together. But he wrote later on, before he passed on, that only a handful of visionaries really recognize that in the indigenous worldview, we can have solutions to our sustainable uh, worldview. Now, as a coach, getting just uh, from the, the, the coaching position, you know, I kind of started not really knowing it when I was a firefighter. I wrote the first books on physical fitness for firefighters and learned a lot about motivational psychology, uh, a book uh, on uh, exercise for children and motivation, and a, a book uh, that was my first dissertation about the economic benefits of 
of wellness, okay? So um, that's kind of where I started. I learned about a phenomenon that you're gonna, I'm gonna introduce you to, that you probably already use inadvertently because it's very natural, but I'm gonna call it by what it's called in the literature and it may cause you to shudder, and that is hypnosis. The phenomenon of hypnosis. Now, an indigenous worldview never knew that word or about brainwave frequencies, but Ceremony is a form of hypnosis. And uh, we've, we've done trans-based healing and trans-based learning for, for, like I say, 99% of human history. Prentice Hall published my book on this because as a firefighter, I found that when people were in states of shock or fear during the first hour post-trauma, you could speak words to them that would allow them to control their autonomic nervous system and uh, you can save many, many, many lives with this. So this is gonna be a technique I'm gonna suggest that all coaches should have in their toolkit. I did my internship at Alta Bates Hospital uh, in Berkeley, California. And this was a, uh, uh, an African-American man who came in with a, a second degree burn from an acetylene torch that burned up on the job. Um, it was my turn to do the, 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 uh, the language pattern. And, uh, I, and I didn't have to hypnotize him per se, because you assume that during the first hour of trauma, people are in a natural state of hypersuggestibility. So I had him imagine his arm being in a cool bow of fresh fall and clean snow after I checked with him to make sure that snow is not a problem for him. 12 days later, this is the healing on the right side, which is un really unheard of uh, with second degree burns. Uh, I also learned most of what I'm going to tell you from a near-death experience in the Rio Urique in Mexico, um, uh, you know, on a kayaking uh, adventure. Um, and when I came back, uh, I had certain skills that I did not have before. One of them was working with wild horses. So Evening Magazine, if you all go onto YouTube, just put in wild horse hypnotist. You'll see me hypnotizing the, uh, the show leader uh, 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 so he can walk up to this, this, this wild horse. Um, and so this idea of coaching other than humans, uh, I had in that one slide with a bunch of different, uh, well, I'll go back to it if I can. I don't know, really know how you go back like this. So I'll just show you real quickly. So this is a, 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 a macaw here in Mexico at my house and that's my dog. And, uh, and so I see coaching as something that we should add to that list uh, and, and, and look at animal training as a form of coaching. And so here, this is the, the, the parrot chasing the dog, but they, you know, they're, they're not killing each other or anything like that. So I just show this really quickly to, to let you know that um, this, is, this is a natural phenomenon uh, across all uh, animal species. And there's a lot of research to back that up. I wanted to just show you this really quick because I've never put this in a, in a PowerPoint and, I, and it just uh, brings tears to my eyes. But this is a buddy of mine that I graduated from high school with in 1964. And uh, a, a friend of ours that also graduated in 1964, his name's Corky Blake. And I, we had, went to our 50th uh, anniversary, uh, high school uh, graduation anniversary. And I called him up and I said, hey, make sure you bring your your instrument, because we used to play in a Dixieland band back in the 19, early 1963. Well, he told me, and he said, you know, I, I haven't played the, 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 the axe, he called it. I haven't played an instrument in five years. Uh, you know, it's, it's been, uh, I've, got, I've got this thing where my hands shake and I can't play. I said, well, bring it anyway. I took him into the, the room that we were in after the uh, celebration, and I said, do you trust me to do some hypnosis with you? And he said, oh, I, I trust you with, with anything, but you're not going to get me to be able to play. I mean, look at my hand. His hand was just shaking. And I said, just, just pay attention to me. And we did the hypnosis. And five minutes later, and I said, see, I told you it would work. All right, so anyway, that, I'm real excited about that. But also, I recently was brought out of retirement, and uh, a lady named Natalie Molhausen, uh, she was 265th in the world in fencing from Brazil. Uh, and last year, she 
won the gold medal uh, world championship, and she's the first Brazilian uh, to ever become a fencing champion uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 her, in her sport. So I think most of you kind of know about sports psychology and the use of visualization, but um, I, I just wanted to kind of remind you, I guess, because I'm going to be talking about what I call the cat fawn phenomenon. And cat is essentially self-hypnosis, recognizing spontaneous hypnosis, trance-based learning, ceremony, meditation, <clears throat> prayer, mindfulness, contemplation, things that I'm sure all of you have in your bag of tools. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the fawn are the worldview perspectives <clears throat> that get us in trouble and keep us from moving from the left side of the chart that I, I'm gonna show you and I, and I showed you 17 of them to the right side. That in the dominant worldview, so authority is generally external to us. It's the professors, it's the books, it's the Pope, it's the teachers, it's the, you know, whatever. It's the Papa. Um, whereas in indigenous worldview, it, you know, we listen with great respect to elders, but then we make our own decisions based on only reflection on honest lived experience, an honest interpretation of lived experience. Um, so there's a lot of autonomy in that. Uh, and, and that's why indigenous cultures were not hierarchical, because there was a great rejection of hierarchy and authority. Uh, dominant worldview, fear is something we avoid at most costs. We're or we're trapped by it or we, you know, uh, and, and, and just frozen by it if it happens after the fight or flight mechanism. Whereas in the indigenous worldview, I'm gonna show you how when fear comes and the fight or flight you know, is, is been taken care of, you can't run, you can't fight. Uh, and so most of our fears today are chronic. If you see it in the indigenous way, you'll see it as a catalyst or an opportunity to practice a virtue. By virtues, there's you know, seven great universals, uh, courage, generosity, patience, fortitude, honesty, humility, you know. Um, uh, so, uh, and I'll give you some examples about that. Um, words, I, we already talked about. And nature uh, in the dominant worldview, I think we have a good sense of it. You think if you look in your own way of being in the world, no matter how much you love animals or, or love gardening or hug trees, at some level, you are more into a dominant perspective that's about either avoiding, uh, afraid of, controlling, or seeing it as an it. Uh, and, and everything in it as a it, uh, as opposed to it being an integral part of our lives, engaged uh, as a fellow sentient being. Uh, and because it was most of the creatures and, 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 and entience, sentience and nature is, was here before us, uh, our, our teacher. Okay, so that's it. Um, uh, you know, and I, that's, this is a book that I wrote uh, uh, that mostly coaches and lawyers bought. I, I meant it for environmentals when I wrote it back in 1991. Uh, uh, and as long as there's a story behind it, but it's called The Bum's Rush, The Selling of Environmental Backlash, Phrases and Fallacies of Rush Limbaugh, who you know has recently just received one of the highest uh, medals of freedom by Trump in the, that, that our country offers. Uh, what a sad thing. But um, uh, in it, he uses classic uh, hypnotic strategies, like double binds and all these kinds of things, which are not bad because salesmen use them. You want to use my pen or yours to sign the contract would be an example of a double bind uh, in an emergency setting. Um, are you more comfortable with your arm on, on your shoulder? I mean, on your belly, or are you more comfortable with your arm next to your side? Saying that to somebody who's bleeding and, 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 and great fear, they will choose one of the two. And then you can say, wow, good. Just let that that feeling of comfort continue and allow that blood pressure to lower. And when I count to three, you're gonna stop the bleeding. So, I told you I would do it fast. And uh, are we back to normal? I yes, think thank are. you. Yes, thank you. All right, good. So that is an overview that I threw together for y'all 
to get a sense of how this phenomenon of, let's call it trans-based learning, or CAT, concentration activated transformation, that all athletes in the past 40 years that won gold medals in the Olympics used. I did a research project on this for my first dissertation uh, and couldn't find a single athlete that had not employed visualization techniques taught in some way by a coach or a, or a, a professional sports psychologist, right? A willful determination is not enough. In fact, one of the laws of, of this phenomenon is the harder you try to do something, the more likely it is you can fail. And I think all of you might be able to see examples of that, right? Um, and so uh, the worldview part of it is a missing link. And uh, one of the articles that was published uh, at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, if you go on, I can show you, uh, just put in uh, four arrows, the missing link. And you'll see an article about how a book that um, I wrote with 18 fielding graduates in the clinical, uh, I mean, in the clinical psych program in uh, neuropsychology and neuroscience found that the, 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 the worldview of the scientists, the neuroscientists who were looking at indigenous precepts like wisdom, courage, spirituality, honesty, had exactly the opposite of what we, we thought would happen. Greg Cahetti uh, from the in Native Studies program at the University of New Mexico and I were the co-authors. And, uh, and when, our, when our fielding students brought us these case studies, they would say things like, well, there's really no thing, such thing as generosity because we looked at people playing Monopoly and when we tapped them on the shoulder, we asked them, they would give automatically all, a lot of their money away. We saw a little light go on in the brain because they're all hooked up it was the same place we saw selfishness. Therefore, in the journal article, peer reviewed journal article, they concluded that all acts of generosity are really ultimately self-serving. So that we get some, well, an indigenous worldview, that's nonsense. And we know it from animal studies. So we changed the name of the book to, uh, if I have a copy here. Yeah, we changed it uh, from uh, neuroscience and indigenous wisdom, because we thought that would be great because everybody really loves neuroscience, to uh, critical neurophilosophy. We coined that word, right? Uh, and, we, and then we put forth the idea that whatever we're doing, including coaching, if we're seeing it through the dominant worldview, which most of us are locked into because we haven't stopped to investigate the origins of our beliefs and our fears, then we are essentially hypnotized into beliefs that no matter how well intended we are, can still operate at a way to stifle us uh, from reaching our highest physical, mental, spiritual, social potentiality, which I think is, is our, all of our goals especially at a time when every life system on the planet is out of balance because of our not living according to our highest potential. Okay, so let's take a break there and see if I said enough to, to uh, allow you to say, whoa, what does this mean? Or what about this? Or, you know, just shoot from the hip. Terry, we're going to start with you. Excellent. Thanks for Excellent. Thanks for We do have a question that's already been posted by CB. And CB, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Terry. Hi, Four Arrows. Thank Hi. you for letting me speak here. So I was fascinated by your ability to speak to somebody who was totally out of it and their ability to hear you. And so my question is, can you give us more examples of this hyper communication? I love this. Oh, I, I'm so, so happy that you asked me that question. I mean, I'll pay you later. We, we said we have this all set up, right? Okay, I'm gonna give a personal example. It's a story I love. I was working for a plastic surgeon named John Emery in San Francisco. 
for people who were doing breast transplants and nose jobs who could not do anesthesia. So I would do hypnosis, they would go under, and I would talk to them because there's some research that shows that when you're unconscious, you're still hearing things. In fact, there are lots of anecdotes where people uh, at a car accident, for example, had a broken leg and some, some very charismatic man like Terry was in the audience uh, watching the paramedics and he said to his neighbor, oh my God, that's the worst break I ever saw. She's never gonna walk again. And then two years later, I'm called into a place and this woman's there and the doctors are saying, there's nothing organically wrong with her leg, but she's bedridden because she won't walk. And we find out that that's what happened and we change it, right? So unconscious language. I have lo I, lots of friends that are going into surgery, coming to me and I say, make sure the doctors don't say something like, oh, I watched that football game yesterday and that guy killed him. Because unconsciously you think the only subject that's in the world is you and anything they say is about you, right? So I have this experience with plastic surgery as a hypnotherapist. When all of a sudden, because I was working my way through college at the time, doing that and still as a firefighter, um, I got the worst pain in my in my uh, side that I've ever had. And they, they had to send me in the ambulance to Kaiser Hospital. Long story short, I had acute appendicitis, white blood cells were off the chart, and they wheeled me in for the surgery. Now, Dr. Trevor Hughes was the anesthesiologist at, at the time, he's still, still there. And he comes in and the thought comes into my mind, wow, this is a chance for me to experience what my patients experience when they're having a breast transplant or an OSHA. And so I thought, I'm going to ask him. I'm sh surely he'll say no. I think I was hoping he would say no. And I said, Dr. Hughes, I'm Dr. Jacobs. I said, uh, I, I work for John, Dr. John Emery, who we knew. I said, you know, is there a, would you allow me to do self-hypnosis on this surgery? You know? And he said yes to my to almost my shock. He said, but I'm gonna hook you up and I want you just to give me the thumbs up if you can't, if you need to go under. I said, oh good, thank you. He played guitar music anyway. I did it. I felt, I felt the incision, sharp pain going uh, up and down. And then I felt a pain like I never felt before in the inner oblique muscle group. And, but my suggestion was to myself, nothing to bother. And so I felt the pain, but I wasn't bothered by it. So think about what is pain if you're not bothered by it. And afterwards, when they came up, the nurses came in, oh, this is the guy that did the, 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 the self-hypnosis for, for surgery. A nurse came over and lifted up the uh, four by four. And to my amazement, I had been imagining it going uh, up and down, but the scar is sideways. And you would know the difference between this or this, right? But the only time I'd ever seen an appendectomy scar had been my dad's. And in the old days, that's how they used to do it. So the imagination is more powerful than the reality. That's what Einstein said in his famous quote, imagination is more powerful than knowledge. So if you have somebody that is going to walk across a two by four that's sitting on the ground and you say, look, I'm your coach. I want you to have more confidence in your balance. Can you walk across this two by four? And they, maybe they do it the first time even. Great. Okay. Now let's go outside. I've got two 70 foot towers and I've got a two by four stretched on them. We'll go ahead and climb up and oh, no way. No, no. But this time I'm going to pay you a million dollars. Still no way. Two million, maybe they'll try it, but they'll fall because the imagined possibility of falling is greater than the knowledge that they could do this. Now, I, I hope that kind of answers your, your, your question that the words we speak, Rudyard Kipling said words are mankind's most powerful drug. The words we speak are sacred vibrations under indigenous worldview. And there were verb-based languages on purpose. They came from 
the, 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 the animals and the trees. And, and if you couldn't categorize a tree as a tree, you had to know if the wind was blowing, if there was a nest in it, lots of words, always in movement, right? So words are very sacred, but in the English language, it's very easy to become entrapped by them. Give you another brief story. Had an executive in San Francisco. I was in Marin County with my practice. Calls me up, wants to make an appointment. I always have my secretary or myself ask why. He said, every time I go into an executive meeting, I sweat profusely under my arms. I got four sports coats hanging up in my office. I've gone to doctors, I've taken drugs. Somebody said I should try hypnosis on, that's why I'm here. I said, okay, well, I'll let my secretary call yours, we'll make an appointment. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, what do you say to yourself just before the meeting? What words do you use? He said, I don't know, I look at my watch and I realize it's, it's time for a meeting. I said, I, I have to get to a meeting. I said, okay. I said, uh, I'll, I'll see you next week. I said, in the meantime, just do one thing for me. Instead of saying I have to get to the meeting, change I have to to I want to. Just do that for me. He, two days later, he calls and cancels the appointment. And my secretary says, what's going on? He says, oh, I think Dr. Jacobs hypnotized me on the phone because I haven't sweated in three meetings, right? I think this is a, and I've got a thousand stories like this. This is a classic example of the powers of words. A woman wants to lose obese, an obese woman wants to get healthy. I'll ask her, what words do you say to yourself? Because we self-hypnotize ourselves to maintain with some authority figure in our early childhood or in a traumatic experience. Remember, because during times of stress, we become hyper-suggestible to the instructions of a perceived trusted authority figure for good or bad. And so, um, the, uh, uh, what, was it, what, what, was I just, what was I just saying about, what was the example I was gonna give? Losing weight. Yeah, okay, so in, in, I have about 10 of them going on at the same time in my mind, uh, but I don't wanna take too much time on examples. So in the losing weight one, uh, the words that she was using, when I said, what, if you're naked and you look into a, wind, a mirror, what do you say to yourself? And she says, huh, I, see some, I see a fat person. I, and, and then we do some work on, because in the world, in, the, in this cat fawn connection, I want you to remember it as that, the cat fawn connection. And I'll tell you if we have time, how, it, how that came to me in a vision. So it was from a real mountain lion and a real fawn. In that cat fawn connection, um, these words are powerful. And when she said, I see a fat person, she learned with a little bit of coaching that she'd have to be in a jar if she was a fat person, right? If she was fat, right? And so she gets more articulate, more accurate. Pretty soon she's got it down. She goes, ah, I see a beautiful woman who happens at this point in time to have more adipose tissue on her body than she wants to for optimal health. Yeah. Now with that new words and the work in hypnosis and the work in worldview reflection, because we can also go into problems of worldview and hierarchy. I can, I can just, let me just real briefly show you uh, when I say I, we can use this worldview chart. I use it in my classes every single class because the students said we have to. When they saw it the first time, they said, you know, it, this works only because you got to use it a lot of times. And by the way, everyone, this uh, chart is available on the website that I put in the chat room. So Super. you can, and I you think can I've uh, modified, download it. Yeah, I think I've modified it a little bit, but not much. The one that you've got will work just fine, right? Just fine. So just have a look at this and let's talk about our our woman that came in uh, who was clinically obese and, and wanted to find out ways that she could, because everything she had done had, didn't work. Uh, so she came in for, you know, working with uh, uh, self-hypnosis because remember, I in my practice, the reason I'm, that I'm not still in it is you couldn't make money when you don't do hypnosis and make everybody think that you're the one doing it. So I've only, I said, 
I will only see you three times. And if you don't get it after that, I'm not going to see you anymore. That was my practice, right? And, uh, uh, and, and it's because all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. So as a good coach, your job isn't to, is to teach them one of the, this is one of the many skills, right? Um, but anyway, so yeah, what we've got fear-based thoughts would, would be a worldview problem that somebody that's traumatized uh, because of their obesity. Um, uh, the fact that in the world, uh, people care more about, uh, too often about selfish goals and materials and personal gain to care about the compassion for somebody who is, who is obese. Um, uh, the materialistic worldview, you can make connections if you were a coach talking to somebody. Maybe, maybe you know, there, there, there's a connection between uh, her, uh, this, this person buying things, this man or woman uh, buying things. Um, uh, using words to deceive self. I am fat. Uh, I mean, I could go through all these things and make you make a connection. And so could you to why people are traumatized uh, by a variety of, of, of kinds of things like that. So I want to see you guys. So I'm going to get rid of my share. Okay, what other questions we've got? So we have a, a request. Uh, one is around examples of your work with horses and other animals. Uh, in using uh, these indigenous worldview perspective? Well, I think the best way to do that, you, have we got six minutes? You think we, we do. do. All right, let's do it. Here we go again. Da, 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 da. I feel like one of those ants in the movies where you transport yourself, right? All right, so all I'm going to do is go on to Google. Now I'm going to put in YouTube. And then I'm going to search uh, wild horse. There it is. And the trailer, they're coming out like a locomotive and they're so, twisting and turning and ready. So I'm going to start in the middle of it uh, because, you know, they were asking me lots of questions about what I do. So I'm just going to show you the, 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 uh, the last four, four, four minutes of it. So um, to give you the background, uh, Evening Magazine, which was a syndicated television program, back when I'm a young man, you can see I, I, how, how, how young and handsome I was there. That, that was maybe, this is maybe 37 years ago when I started this. But anyway, uh, we brought in a horse from the Bureau of Land Management, and uh, I had it rope tied up between these things for one day, and it was rope growth. And then, uh, then they came in with their cameras. Believe. And it really requires two 40-foot ropes. Then in one day, the horse is basically rope rope. They learn very rapidly. And then using hypnosis, using the um, ability to know when they are in hypnosis and when they are out of it, by watching them relax. Do you, do you use your voice? Do you use your hand movements? It really doesn't matter. Whatever ritual you want to use. I use sometimes singing. Um, sometimes I'll use a particular massage place. It really doesn't matter as long as that's associated with the state of relaxation that the horse is experiencing. Okay, it makes you feel a little nervous after seeing that horse rear up and fall over like that. Yeah. A bit. Okay. Well, the whole idea is that that's all your critical faculty thinking about it. And now what I want to do is get in touch with your, your really innermost self, that confidence that you know this is a horse that's not me. You believe me when I tell you that. And if he knows it, you know that everything's going to be fine. So what I just want you to do is just look at my finger. As my finger goes down under your chin, I just want you to watch it. I want your eyes to close by the time it gets under your chin. Very good. And take a big breath here. Big breath. And as you exhale, think relaxation, calm, peace, safety, nothing to bother. Okay? And I'm sure you're going to open your eyes. You're going to have all confidence in the world. You're going to feel real good. And you're going to walk up to this horse with a lot of love and peace and harmony. Okay? One, two, three. Great. Okay, we're going to we'll walk up to him, pet him, and talk to him, and everything will be fine. Okay, solitaire. Okay, son. Now, what I'm doing now, I'm going to be using some voice tonations that are really as much for me, Rich, as they are for the horse, okay? Because now as I'm talking, I can sing a song, all of me, why not take all, and what this is doing, this is helping me relax a little bit. Now, now this is a big animal. He could easily put his lips through two inches of plywood. A few weeks ago, he was kicking butt on mountain lions, and now we're saying to him, nice horsey. Now, if I change my demeanor right now, he would rear, okay? Okay, now easy. Easy, see that? That's that's no demeanor. Now what? Okay. All of me. Why not take all of me, kids, son? 
Namely, the disappearance of the wider on the eye. We'll let you know that he's in a new relaxed state. That's a sign when his eyes get about eye level with me. I know that he's going to stay relaxed and I can begin to touch him. Good boy. Okay, now, right now, he's relaxed and trust the vibrations that I have. Here. That's all there is to him. Easy. I'm going to keep that in. See? Try this lower and lower and relax. Good. Hey, Rich, you, know, you can do it. You know, no problem. Uh, really, no problem. You like me. I like you. I like you. Here, can you put your hand on my shoulder? Can you put your head on my shoulder? Oh, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Can you, can you put your head on my shoulder there? I knew you could. How is it? Is there whiteness I know? Am I in trouble? Now, I've been around horses most of my life, and this is the first time I've seen anything like this. This is no good. Don Jacobs' music can soothe the savage beast. This animal has never had anything on his back before. We're watching the very first time. No problem. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. No problem. No problem. No problem. Good boy. All good horsemen know that. So, am I back? Yes. Okay. So that that's kind of a living example of uh, to answer your to answer your question. Um, and I have you know so many I've I've done so many of them for the Bureau of Land Management and they've been my greatest greatest teachers. Wonderful. Thank you. So CB had another question. CB, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Can everybody be hypnotized? And if you can't, can you still um, participate in hypersuggestions? So, so everyone is naturally, if you define, let me define hypnosis for you, the way we're looking at it, that should be a coach's perspective. When you believe in an image strongly while in an alternative brainwave frequency, you are achieving the hypnotic phenomenon. Let me say it again. I'm going to say that we naturally go into hypnosis or we do it in the office of somebody because we have the expectation and the belief that they have some skill right? Or we're frightened and somebody tells us something, but I'm kind of trying to show you how, you know, this is a normal thing. It's not something you have to pay me $300 an hour to do. This is something that everybody does, right? Now, as a professional coach, you will have skills with which to teach the skills to your, your client. That's a different story, but they are going to do it. You can do it one or two times so they can experience it, but that's not the goal, right? That's not the goal. And some, most states allow for people to be hypnotherapy. Some don't. You have to be certified in order to practice hypnotherapy. So I wouldn't even call it hypnosis. I would call it CAT, Concentration Activated Transformation. And I would not consider yourself as a hypnotist at all. I would consider yourself as a coach that knows a tool that is one of the most powerful tools that indigenous people use a long time. What is ceremony? It's the definition I just gave you. Believing in an image strongly enough to create an automatic response while in, and that only happens while in an alternative brainwave frequency. Right now we're both in, in beta, right? In alpha, you, you know, have you guys ever played with a pendulum before? Let me show you. This is the easiest way to know if you are in, if you are in a hypnotic state without having to pay anybody anything. Can you all see this or not? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, if I imagine, if I move it around, you'll see my fingers move. You see it go in a circle, right? But I did that with normal relaxed, you know, normal uh, muscles. So a lot of you must have been played with a pendulum before or a Ouija board or something. All right, so now I'm gonna imagine it going in a circle. Now, once it starts going in a circle, what's important to know is that means I have gone into a light trance worthy of a secondary affirmation. 
So before I do this, I want us to write down, when I give a presentation to this class, I really want my intuition to tune in to what they're feeling. And I really want to know what things to come up with to show them. That, and I want that to, I want myself to really catch on to that. Maybe that would be uh, something I would do before a presentation like this. You get that in mind, and it's got to be phrased positively. A golfer who only learns this a little bit and says, he comes to a sand trap, and he says, ah, oh, I'm going to use a little hypnosis. So he imagines his arm raising up, and as soon as it starts to go up, he knows he's in hypnosis. And then he double tasks, and he says, ah, I'm not going to hit the ball in the sand trap. Where's it going to go? <laughs> right in the sand trap. Because imagery, you can image the ball, you can image the sand trap. Words like N-O-T, not, I'm, right? So you've got to phrase them positively. I am going to hit the ball down the fairway after you recognize it, right? So once you get this, you just hold this pendulum between your finger and thumb. Imagine it going in a big circle. You see there's no movement in my hand. And now I'm going to imagine and believe in the image of throwing the perfect pitch. Or when I get tired on my path, see now it's stopping because I'm trying to think of what to say. You want to think of what to say before you do it, right? So the pendulum is just a device. Now, professional hypnotherapists, like I taught this at UC Berkeley, by the way, for MFCC licensure, for marriage, family, child counselors, who needed to get 30 hours before they were legally able to use hypnosis, right? And, and then you would use this as a biofeedback machine. Do you really want to smoke? And you would have told them this is going to, this is no, and this is yes. And people say, yes, I really want to smoke. But this thing would be saying no, right? So that's how professionals often, often use it. I'm teaching you to use it just, and you can use a piece of dental floss and a paper clip. Works great. Just use it as a way to know if you are in. And you know, don't get, you'll get, don't freak out when it happens. Go, oh, what caused that or whatever. Just trust that this is a part of our brain that children use for the first five years of life. That's why they can learn 10 languages in five years if they're living in a household, right? That's also why most of our problems are things that we shouldn't have learned our first year, five years of mm -hmm. life. Okay? Does that help? Yes. Somebody else get in there. Cookie, you must have a question. <laughs> I, um, hi, I don't have a question, but I have to tell you that I have worked with self-hypnosis for many years and um, I don't use it as often. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> it's my birthday today. Um, oh, happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. So you caught me off guard there. But anyway, so, um, but it really functions. And when I'm really stressed out, I just close my eyes and I've learned how to not feel my body Thank you, Elena, Elena. So um, the horses I used to ride, and I know the energy that has to go to riding horse, but I think that it's very powerful. It's, I came in a bit late. I hope I'll be able to find the link to the presentation again. But it's, um, it's, it, it, there's a sense, the wording that you use, as you say, and the approach to the whole issue of polarization, polarities, untruthfulness and truthfulness. So I'm an intercultural um, trainer and coach, and we, we look exactly at those things. So how is it that you perceive things? And when you change your perception or you understand that the perception is different from the other side, then it really um, helps um, engage judgment and relax this situation. So... So you have this part down. And so what I want you to be doing is get a copy of that worldview chart or email me and I'll send you the, the updated one. Thank but you. Now start looking at how a, a failure to investigate the core understandings of our assumptions of whether they be hierarchy or authority or whatever, how that's the missing link and how you so beautifully articulated it. Thank you for that. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for the birthday wishes to everybody who's texted and chatted. Thank you. You know, and I saw a little chat box in there. In, you know, we are in, in a in a phenomenon. I just wrote an article that I uh, is going to be coming out uh, in about an hour. I think. Oh, well, actually, it's out right now. Here, let me show it to you. Uh, I it just out. But this is to answer your question, uh, Steve. I'm going to go back. Uh, share screen again. Here we go again. Da -da -da -da. And I love this function, by the way, to do this. Okay, so here it is. It just, it just went up. You guys are the first ones to see it. Hi, can you guys see it yet? We do. Somebody say, yeah. all right. Higher education leaders, I'm calling you out. How much longer will you tolerate the Trump phenomenon? And... I, uh, you can read, you can just, all you got to do is go to, uh, I don't know, Four Arrows, Op-Ed News, Higher Education Leaders, and you can all, you can all read this later, right? But um, uh, we've got to understand that uh, um, the phenomenon that we're talking about, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you through this, uh, let me go back to, Get to see your beautiful faces here. Uh, and, and, and this this book, and, and there's an amazing history I, I, about it that, but I'll show you some of the phrases that, that when they're used, have a great linguistic vibration power. And you can use them as coaches, like a lot of lawyers buy, buy this book. And, and, and there's no good or bad judgment on it. It's just, being a good, a good speaker of, of words, right? And, 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 but here are the kinds of words that Rush Limbaugh and Donald Trump naturally do as salesmen uh, that allows you to completely uh, be mesmerized if the right background and worldview and hypnosis phenomena is taking place so that you literally become a part of a cult uh, which can happen with certain religions. It can happen in all kinds of things. And of course, Steve wrote an amazing book uh, demonstrating this. But here's some of the words about it. Uh, telling stories and using metaphors, double binds, contingency. These are persuasive words, rapport words, um, uh, uh, authority use, use of humor, uh, Emotional words, pacing, questions, missing words, absolutes. Uh, then there's fallacies that, that can be used to mislead people. Ignoring the issue, either or. Uh, personal attacks, face value, after this, because of this. Then there's intense signals like you hear us versus them, absolute certainty, uh, uh, affiliations, intimidation. So, you know, a lot of this stuff has to do with the recognizing when you're starting to get sucked into something, right? Doesn't mean that you have to be afraid or reject it. You just know, you just smile, you know, and like the nurse is going to give you a shot. And she says, you know, this is going to, this is going to hurt a little bit. You can just stop and go, well, oh, just one second, nurse. Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not. Thank you. But it's not. You don't have to buy into what people say, right? You can listen carefully and is it the truth or not? That's the thing that we've got to learn. And that's what I write about in that article is even in higher education, we are not dealing with this kind of a subject that you guys and, and, and Terry has thought would be important for you guys are talking about right now, right? We are right back into status quo, talking about your careers and this stuff. We're not talking about the fact that during the COVID, we have done more to do the things that caused the COVID than before. Deforestation has increased, plastic pollution, contamination of the air, right? This is a airborne fine particle. The reason the Navajo Nation is, in, is hit worse than anybody in the United States and that the United States has hit worse than any other country is because of the uranium mines that were left uncapped, causing 85% of the households to have fine particle uranium dust that this virus spirit walks across and that has caused them to have uh, uh, 
respiratory distress that allows us to come in. Just Google the relationship between uh, uh, deforestation and COVID and the, re and the relationship between air pollution and COVID. And you, 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 but we're not talking about how we can get ourselves to recognize what it is that has allowed the kind of political structure, the kind of decisions that are happening. It can only be in my mind when, when after 99% of human history, we began to start to pollute our rivers, kill our forests, become superior to nature. That can only be a hypnotic phenomenon to me. I can't imagine that, a, that someone could have done that completely with all of their uh, uh, faculties working and knowing what images they're holding on to and, wh and what the source of them is. So, Steve, so did that I'm work for you? Yeah. So, so one last question, I know we're uh, about out of time today, and, and this is, I think, a good next step for everyone on the call, and uh, we had a, a question, um, do you have direction for us to begin a practice of CAT? So if, if you were going to recommend, you know, where to start reading or um, one of your books, or how would you recommend people uh, on the call? Try I think uh, some uh, of this. You can, you, can, you can Google for free the, uh, just put in Cat Fawn Connection Journal of Moral Education. It's a peer-reviewed journal where I wrote all about it as relates to moral education. Uh, my book, Point of Departure, uh, takes you through each of the steps, starting with trance-based learning. Each chapter is one of the steps in the Cat Fawn called Point of Departure, Returning to Our More Authentic uh, worldview. If you go on my on my website uh, or just Google Four Arrows books, I'm sure that 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 they'll they'll come out. So those are good starting starting places. Um, uh, I think though that this is in your DNA. It's in your spirit. It's in your it's in your basic coaching background. If you just start to say, you know what, get what's the, what's the source of my beliefs that hypnosis is of the devil. Or what's the source of my belief that hypnosis is a fake or as of Hollywood? Get on Google, see what kinds of medical operations and heart transplants are happening with it. Get a sense of, and then start saying, well, do you really need to pay somebody? Or is it something that's natural? Start learning on your own so that you get confidence in it and start practicing it. You can practice it with your pendulum by getting it going in a circle, that's pretty safe. When you take a nice warm shower in the winter, this winter, say to yourself, I'm gonna turn the hot water off and I'm gonna stand here under ice cold water with nothing to bother. You know, Start practicing it and then look at the worldviews and you can start doing that with the chart with your clients right away saying, do you kind of see that that tree over there is not sentient? Let's talk about that, right? Or do you feel this hierarchy and authority or, or that's where it's at? Let's talk about that, right? Just doing the metacognitive work. Remember, this is a combination of fawn, which is metacognitive worldview reflection between these two uninvestigated worldviews and the cat. All right, you guys, our time is up and I love you and any kind you need to contact me, do so. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie for uh, any announcements you might have. Yeah, no, thank you guys. I really appreciate you staying to the very end and then some. Um, Four Arrows, his information is in the chat box. It's also in the blogs that are posted and um, you guys have a great night. If you have further questions and you wanna stay on, I'm happy to be here for a couple more minutes.